Good day and welcome to the first episode of Dungeoneering 101. My name is Rick and I am here to teach you everything you need to know about Dungeons and Dragons. Now, I've seen a lot of different videos out there and I think the biggest thing that they're missing is starting with the basics. So we're going to go through and talk about every little bit of the character sheet and how you come up with these answers. Because it's one thing, everybody has predetermined characters you can use, but they don't show you how to do anything. And included on my Discord, I have this template right here, which I took the liberty of kind of typing in just a little cheat sheet to get where everything comes from. So we're going to go ahead and start off at the top. This is Gundrak Stonefist. He is a level one fighter and he is a mountain dwarf. So background is where your character comes from. Now, in Dungeons & Dragons, they have a bunch of different mechanical advantages for each of the backgrounds. You can choose any one of them you want, and they all provide different things. They don't necessarily mean anything because, for example, there's a charlatan, somebody who grew up as kind of a scoundrel. And you could have a paladin that grew up as a scoundrel but changed his ways. Or you could have a cleric who's still a scoundrel. It doesn't define who your character is, it just shows where they came from. So, not only that, we have alignment, which his alignment is neutral good. There's a whole debacle about alignment, but there are nine different alignments, and long story short, they don't really matter. Your character is who you want them to be. It doesn't matter what the paper says. If they're good, they can still do bad, and if they're bad, they can still do good. So, I don't think it's a good representation of it. But we're going to go ahead and get started. The most important six things that you're going to come up with are your strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Now these are done one of three ways. So the first way is called standard array, which I have up here. That means that you take these numbers and plug them right in. 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. Now these numbers represent how good your character is at something. So being a fighter, strength is going to be my best thing. Followed by Constitution. Now, not to be outdone, he is going to be decently wise for what he is. He's Wisdom also includes your perception, so I want him to be able to perceive things. He can think tactically. His dexterity might be next. 10 is considered the average, so that means that they will, he is average intelligence, and eight means he is below average. So he is a gruff warrior, but he is not exactly a, a good speaker. So each of these numbers is assigned a value, a modifier, if you will. So how you get that modifier is you do whatever number you're at. So for strength, it'd be 15 minus 10, and then you divide it by two. So, I guess if you want to use order of operations, it's going to be something like that. So what happens is 15 minus 10 is 5, divided by 2 is 2 and a half. So you don't, you round down, so it's a 2. So dexterity going over the same route is a 1. Constitution is a 2. Intelligence is a 0. Wisdom is still a 1. And charisma is actually a minus 1. So these values represent when you roll on a dice, what you're going to add or subtract to it. Now, when you go under inspiration, if you do a good job and your DM thinks that your role playing is very well, or they just specifically like something, they might give you an inspiration. So you add or subtract based on what they give you. Proficiency is found where your class is. So when you go into your class, let's see here, it's down here. So at first level, your proficiency bonus is plus two. So you're just going to add a two there, which means that, let's see. So now the rest of this starts getting a little more tedious, but it's not too bad. So since he is a dwarf, you look under your race. So it looks like dwarfs get plus two to their constitution. So... I'm going to change this to a 16 and make this 3. Now, 
these are all features that come with your race. So alignment, it just gives you an example of what mo most dwarfs are like. They're between four and five feet. Let's see, base speed is 25. So while we're filling this out, I'll just go ahead and put in 25. We just kind of go down. So Dwarven Resilience. So what I like to do, now I don't know if it's gonna do this correctly, but we'll find out. Hey, look, there we go. It went in just fine. So we'll add that in our feats. And you would do that for each one of these. Now for tool proficiencies, you gain, let's see, proficiency with an artisan tool of your choice. So in the game, these the tool proficiencies aren't something that's exactly mechanically helpful. Uh, they can be in some sense, but it, there's never going to be a time where you're walking through a dungeon and you say, uh, you know, you check for traps. Oh, well, do you have brewer's supplies? Like, no. But if you wanted to brew your own beer, perhaps being proficient with brewer supplies will give you an advantage. So when you roll, there's a good chance that what you come up with you, is a success. So when you pick these, you just think carefully about what you want. It, it's a flavor for your character in a sense. Because D&D isn't like a video game where you put in slots. D&D is more of a... It's a role-playing game. It's a game where everything you do, you're doing it to further your character in some way to flesh them out and that's the same with languages so you automatically have common and dwarvish which so under languages you would put it right down here in other proficiencies and languages ignore all my notes i'm just showing you where they go so they give you an idea of how a dwarf might speak so it says you know they use harsh consonants so maybe you'd like to use a Scottish accent. It's pretty normal for a dwarf. But it doesn't necessarily mean anything in, in their world. You know, maybe maybe dwarves have Russian accent. It is very strong. Yes, you, you understand? Yes. So under dwarf, there are two different kinds. There are mountain and hill. Now, being that a hill dwarf gives wisdom, I think I'm going to pass on that one. I'm, I'm okay. I don't want, I don't want that. So we're going to go down a mountain, and it says you get plus two to your strength. That looks more in line with what I'd like. So let's go ahead and change this to a 17, bringing that up to a three. Oops, there we go. And so down here, you gain proficiency with light and medium armor automatically. Now, I normally would put that in my proficiencies, but I happen to know that when you're a fighter, so... We are going to go down to where Fighter is. We're going to get some of that stuff later. So, now we're going to move on to hit points. So a hit dice is essentially how tanky your character is. So a d10. So right here is your maximum hit point. So a Fighter is going to start out with a d10. But at level 1, you get a special bonus you automatically get maximum hit points plus your constitution modifier. So when you're looking at your modifier, we just have to go back down to here. So you see it's a plus three. So we're looking at 13 health maximum to start. So now at higher levels, see so you roll your D10. Six is the average plus your constitution modifier every fighter level. So your proficiency, you gain all armor and shields. You gain all all simple and martial weapons. So basically all weapons. Uh, you don't gain any tools. Now your saving throws are strength and constitution. That seems weird, but up here there's these two little check marks. So you hit those in there. I'm going to put three and three. So when you're proficient in a saving throw, what that essentially means is, is that when you're called upon to use one of these, you have the expertise to add your proficiency to it. Next up, we are going to choose skills. So you gain two skills from any of these. Now, knowing that each one of these skills is attached to a different kind of ability score will change how you think about it. Because even though fighter can gain animal handling, when I look over here in animal handling, which is right up here, you see that it's wisdom. Since 
my wisdom is only a plus one. Adding proficiency to these, adding a two to whatever I roll to any of these, will not help me greatly. But, for example, if I would like athletics, it's strength. So I would add three and two, making it five. So I'm definitely going to pick athletics. And for my second one, I do like perception. Perception is always good to have. Because what it's essentially saying is that you're better at looking at things. You're better at finding things. You're better at seeing things before anyone else does. So all that down, we now have to go to our equipment. So we can have chainmail, leather armor, longbow, and 20 arrows. Since I envision Gundrak as somebody who runs into battle valiantly, I think he's going to have chainmail. So, for the sake of this, I'm going to get rid of all of this here. And we're going to put in chainmail. Now, when you look, chainmail itself is on page 145 in the player's handbook. Now, to cheat sheet, I have a little thing off a roll 20 here that shows me all the different things. So we're going to have chain mail. So that means that it is an, it has an AC and armor class of 16. So what that means is we're going to put chain mail here. And I'm just going to add a little note that it's AC 16. And disadvantage for stealth. Now what that means is your armor class, which is right up here, it's going to be 16. For somebody to hit you, they have to roll at least a 16. Now, I don't know what the official ruling is on who wins ties. I have always played that the attacker wins ties. I give everybody the choice at the beginning of the campaign. If they want attackers to win, then that's fine. If they want defenders to win, that's fine. As long as everybody's on the same page and we're all having fun. That's all that matters. So next up, we have a martial weapon and a shield, or two martial weapons. So now, this time, we're going to actually go up here, and weapons can be found on page 149. So I'm going to get rid of these now, since we don't need that. And we're going to go to weapons. Now, these are simple, so they're always going to be martial. So any of these weapons here. Now, when you're looking at a weapon, what really matters is going to be the number. So a D8 slashing means that you roll one of your D8s, and that is how much damage you do whenever you hit. A D10, D12, makes sense, right? Two D6. <clears throat> now, where it starts getting a little more complicated is when you add in the properties. So right before the weapons, you'll see that there's a big thing like this. You'll see it starts out like this, and then it has all the different properties of the weapons. Whether it be, I'm seeing it, here we go. Whether it be finesse, heavy, light, loading. Take the time to read through each one. I mean, they all have different things. None of them, other than possibly something like the lance right here. It has a special property that makes it very difficult to use unless you're on a horse. So... You may not want to use that one, but it's all a matter of preference for the most part. I mean, some things will inherently do a little bit more damage, but it's all about what you want your character to do. Nobody is, I mean, nobody has the right to tell you that you're using the wrong weapon. If you want to use a Morning Star, even though you can use another one handed weapon and do a D10, that's their problem, not yours. So, for my martial weapon and a shield, he is probably going to use a Warhammer right here, which is a D8. So Warhammer is 1D8 bludgeoning, and I can use it versatile, but I don't have to. So we're going to go Warhammer. Damage is 1D8, and then I just put BLG for bludgeoning. So for the physical types of damage, there are three, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing. It really only matters for damage type as far as if a monster is resistant to it. Uh, for example, a slime might be 
immune to bludgeoning damage because it doesn't make any sense to hit Jello and have it do anything, but slicing it may work better. So he's going to have that, and he's also going to have his shield down here. We're going to add shield. And a shield gives you two AC, which, when I come back into the armor, you'll see is right down here at the bottom, so it's a plus two to your AC. Bringing this fella's AC all the way up to 18 now. Which 18 is nothing to uh, scoff at. It's actually pretty good. That means when something rolls with its modifiers, it has to be at least an 18 to hit him. So next up, we have a light crossbow or two hand axes. Well, Gundrak never really favored any of the crossbows, so he's going to keep his two hand axes. So, we're going to throw in a hand axe. I usually put the amount if it's a ranged weapon here, just because it's easier to keep track of. So, we're going to go back up here, and our hand axe is going to be 1d6 slashing, and this 2060 is what's important right here. So, 1d6 slashing. Oh, I can't spell slashing. I guess that'll work. We'll do SLA. And it's 2060. So what 2060 means is, is that you can throw a hand axe 20 feet regular. When you throw it, that's great. That's fine. When you throw it 60 feet, you, it, you have less of a chance to hit. It's not as good of a chance to hit. And we'll get into advantage and disadvantage a little later. I won't overwhelm you while we're still talking about the weapons. So... <clears throat> So next up, we have a Dungeoneering pack and an Explorer's pack. So here we are at the two all, all the different kinds of packs. So we have a Dungeoneering pack, which is a backpack, a crowbar, a hammer, 10, I call them pittons, but apparently they're pitons, uh, 10 torches, a tinderbox, 10 days of rations, and a water skin, and it has 50 feet of rope. Or we can have the Explorer's pack, which is backpack, bedroll, mess kit, tinderbox, 10 torches, 10 days of rations, and a water skin, and 50 feet of rope. Now to me, the Dungeoneering pack sounds way better. I like the crowbar and the hammer. I think that both of those are very versatile and useful tools. Uh, if you need it in a door, it works a lot better a lot of times. So, so we're going to go down here and go... We're going to throw in a Dungeoneering pack. So now... It's up to you whether you want to write down what's in them or not. I generally remember what's in them for the most part, so it's not a big deal. But down here, there's actually a couple different places that you can put stuff for that. So we'll get to that in a little bit. So now we have to choose a fighting style. Now going just off of the player's handbook, you have these styles right here. So... Since Gundrak is actually going to be the party tank, I'm going to use the defensive fighting style, which gives him another plus one to his AC. I'm going to put... So he gets one AC from that, bringing him all the way up to 19. He's getting pretty difficult to hit by this point, especially for level one. So, next we're going to copy in the second wind feature because this is quite useful. I will try not to delete what I already have. So, in this case, second wind allows you to regain hit points equal to 1d10 plus your fighter level. Because of the fact that you have hit dice right here, so your hit dice come from your class, so you'll see on this Let's see, where is it at here? It is lower than that. There it is. So you gain one hit dice per level. So a level one fighter will have one hit dice. A level two fighter will have two, and so on and so forth. So we're going to put one total hit and one d10 for hit dice. That's d0. One d10 for hit dice. So what's going to happen is whenever you take, there are two types of rests. When you want to stop and take a little breather, generally around 20 minutes to an hour, you can roll to regain hit dice. 
or roll to regain health with your hit dice, I should say. When you roll to regain your health, you would use whatever your hit dice is. So for the day, I have one hit dice. So if I am, for example, my maximum health is at 13. If I am at four, whoa, four health, and I say, wow, we need to stop for a minute, and I bust out my handy dandy dice. Where are you at here, dice? There you are. So I will roll 1d10, and it looks like I rolled a 3. So unfortunately, I roll a 3, and it's plus my constitution, so I gain 6 health back. So I would now be at a grand whopping total of 10 out of 13 points. Oh, better not change that. Here's current, so it would go under here, so it'd be 10. So next up, as we travel down the fighter ladder here, equipment, fighting style, second win, there you go. So it looks like that is everything that I gain at first level. So now to talk about what's left. Your initiative. Your initiative is always gonna be whatever your dexterity modifier is. That's just default. So if you have plus three, it'd be plus three, plus two, plus two, zero. It could be minus one if you want to have a slow character. Now, there are feats in the game that allow you to gain a bonus to your initiative, but not necessarily your dexterity. One of the feats you can gain is called alert. And alert gives you plus five to initiative. So it would bring him up to level uh, six initiative. So if he were to roll, let's say a 15, he would have a 21 on initiative. Anything that he beat in a number, he goes first in battle. So if he rolled a 21 and the goblin rolled a 15, he goes first. So as we come down, all of these are determined by your background area. Now they are not necessarily set in stone because they give you suggestions, but none of them are required. If your character, you have a completely different idea, or I mean, honestly, I personally don't normally use these boxes. I have a set idea of what I feel like my character should be like, and I don't need a predetermined thing to tell me personality traits, ideals, bonds, or flaws. It's, it's optional. If your character, you want him to have Tourette syndrome, or if you want him to have a nervous tick of some kind, if you want him to be completely blowheartedly full of himself, that is perfectly fine. You don't need a chart to tell you that that's possible. Just do it. Uh, the main rule, don't be a dick at the table. Don't be that guy. Don't be the one that everybody's like, oh, God, he's talking again. So with that, that is going to be the end of the first video. Uh, feel free to leave a comment below for some you know, comments or criticisms, anything like that. If I missed anything, let me know. And uh, I'll see you guys next time.